I'm sure you've heard that the definition of insanity is to expect different results from doing the same thing. And I, I know like the most common mistake people make when they're doing poorly is just to do more of the thing that has led to poor performance. So don't do like twice as much of the thing that hasn't been working if whatever you're doing isn't working. Instead of doing more of the thing that doesn't work, just try some new things and maybe they'll work better. So I definitely want everyone in here to succeed and uh, most days I'm sitting around all lonely in my office. Nobody's coming to ask me questions about fluid mechanics. So stop by if I can help you out. I'd, I'd love to uh, chat fluids with you. Okay, today lab is at two o'clock and do I remember correctly that the A through J people go first today? All right, so then at 3 p.m. is K through Z. We're gonna be doing the flow visualization lab today. That's the one with all the, mar the glass marbles and a bunch of uh, dye way up at the top. It's an interesting one, a little bit tricky, so hopefully it goes well. Uh, a week from today, our class meeting will be a recorded video, but then later that same day in the afternoon, our lab will be in person. So online in the morning, in person in the afternoon. And then your next homework assignment is also due that day. It's flow classification, acceleration, and Euler's equation. Most of the info that leads into that assignment will go over in Thursday's class of this week, but there are a couple of things that uh, related to flow classification, so you can start on this assignment after today's class. Any announcement questions? Okay, um, so far in the semester, chapter two and chapter three is what we've been doing. And uh, both of those chapters were just talking about fluids at rest. So discussing fluid properties and hydrostatics. But um, from here on out, we'll be talking about fluids in motion. And fluids in motion matter because the vast majority of projects that you're going to encounter professionally have to do with fluids in motion, whether it's blood circulating through the human circulatory system or whether it's water that's making its way through a dam, fluids in movement are, um, are the vast majority of the problems that we have to examine. And uh, what makes it uh, tricky is that a lot of the equations that we've used so far don't apply when the fluid is flowing. Hydrostatic equation, for example, which tells us the relationship between depth and pressure starts to fall apart when the fluid is flowing. Does it feel a little stuffy in here? Seems a little stuffy. It was on heat. I'm going to put it onto auto and just let the computer decide. We'll see. All right. Um, there's two different ways to keep track of fluids in motion two general approaches to trying to, uh, to look at and examine a fluid that's moving. And the Lagrangian approach basically tries to keep track of individual particles. And so if you have a, uh, a system of fluid, then the Lagrangian approach would say, let's keep track of every molecule of water in that system. And we'll track those particles by describing their coordinates at a given time. So at, at a certain instant of time, we know the x, y, z location of a particle. If we're thinking in three dimensions, of course, the x, y, z, the, the um, distance forward from a point to the side from a point and vertically up from our starting point. And so a velocity following this approach, what you'd need to do is keep track of the change of a particle's position over time in order to understand its velocity. Now, the challenge with the Lagrangian approach is that for most systems, it's not practical to keep track of all of the fluid particles. Even just a, uh, a very small diameter pipe is going to have many trillions of water molecules flowing through a certain point every second. And so, um, the Lagrangian approach is usually abandoned in the real world and instead the Eulerian approach is used instead because what it will do is it will create a mesh or um, a grid and it will 
look at a certain location where fluid is flowing through and it will assign the flow direction to all particles that go through that window. In other words, it will use a single particle's performance as representative of a group. So instead of keeping track of individual particles, we're just going to say, let's assume that all of the particles in this particular component of the mesh have the same characteristics, the same fluid properties and the same direction, the same speed. Um, so we keep these fixed locations in mind. And all of the particles that flow through the window, the properties of that fluid also pass through the window. And so instead of keeping track of the individual particles position and velocity over time, then we would just assign the same velocity and um, acceleration characteristics to all the particles inside of one of the elements. And so if you want a lot of accuracy, then you'd make this mesh fine. And each one of the windows would be smaller. And um, if you don't have enough computational power, for a fine mesh, then maybe you'd make fewer elements and it would be quicker to compute. So um, there are computer models that use this approach for um, trying to look at what direction, like what uh, path fluid particles take through a system. And um, they look at the pressure on either side of a mesh and they are able to assign boundary conditions like there's a wall in a certain point and keep track of fluid around those boundaries. Um, so the Eulerian approach is kind of what we'll be using this semester when we uh, learn equations like uh, the Bernoulli equation and Euler's equation for answering the question, what is going to be the pressure as a fluid moves from point to point? Like the whole point of chapter three, you could say, Chapter 3 answered the question of what is the pressure of the fluid at a certain depth um, and the effects of the pressure, like forces. So the same thing is true for most of the rest of this class is we're trying to predict how does fluid pressure change and all of the things that are related to pressure. So these new equations that you're going to be learning try to answer the same question that the hydrostatic equation answered. Hydrostatic says what's the change in pressure? That's also what we'll be learning with Euler's equation, Bernoulli's equation, the energy equation. All these things that are to come are trying to predict how pressure and related um, properties change as fluid flows through a conduit. All right, so we're looking at a picture of a car in a wind tunnel. And there's a surprising amount of information that we can gather from a photo like this. Um, and just to illustrate, what direction is, now there's wind that's going through this wind tunnel. You know, it's actually in active use right now. And so is the wind blowing like sideways from the back or from the front? It's from the front to the back. So from the right side to the left. And how can you tell what way the wind is blowing? Okay, the streamlines follow the contour of the car, but wouldn't they also follow the contour of the car if the wind was going from the back to the front? They follow the contour from the front to the back. Okay, so, so you're just saying that maybe if it was going the opposite direction, it would look different than it looks right now? Yeah, if it were going the opposite direction, it would not follow the contour of the front of the car. Okay, all right, so maybe it would get, uh, it would experience some turbulence on the back and it, it might not dip back down. Is there another indicator that the fluid is going from the right towards the left? Dispersion. Dispersion. Good. Yeah, so this smoke is being used as a tracer. And the smoke is all together here. But just like if I was going to throw a smoke grenade in the corner of the room, it would, that smoke would spread out through the process known as diffusion. And so here, there's bulk flow of the smoke from right to left, that's called advection, when the wind is pushing the smoke. But as it's also experiencing advection, it's also spreading out a little bit. So it's diffusing. And so you can see that the smoke is a little bit blurry on the left. And it's not because of the focus of the image. It's just that the boundary 
between where the smoke is and where the smoke isn't is becoming a little bit more nebulous as the molecules of the smoke start to diffuse outward away from the center that they used to be in. So the diameter of the smoke here was maybe two inches. The diameter of the smoke here is going to be larger than that. And so the, it starts to spread out. And I think that's another clue, is by looking at these streamlines and, uh, and knowing that um, the smoke is more concentrated on the right. There's other things that we can tell. Um, as these tracer lines get closer together, that means that the velocity is increasing. And so here, where the streamlines are further apart, there's some velocity. But the velocity increased where they get closer together. And it's because of the, you know, this passenger compartment. Um, it's forcing the air upward. And so just in the same way that you probably have heard a wing operates, where the fluid flows over the top of the wing with a greater velocity than it flu flows over the bottom of a wing. And the same thing happens with cars. That's part of the reason why they have spoilers to generate downward force, because without spoilers, a car can act like a wing and generate lift on the top part of the vehicle, and it begins to lose traction, because the air that flows under the car is flowing at a lower velocity than the air that flows over the top, and that difference in velocity actually causes lift. So that's part of the reason why these spoilers exist. But back to the idea of what we can learn from the picture, is that uh, whenever these streamlines get closer together, that suggests fluid acceleration. So what we're talking about today is different types of flow patterns and how we can visualize and recognize those flow patterns. Streamlines are velocity vectors that indicate the direction of velocity, but not necessarily the magnitude, not in a uh, strict and quantitative way. We can sometimes get some relative magnitude information from streamlines, but not absolute. From this picture, we don't know if the wind is going 100 meters per second or 10 meters per second. We don't know. But we can see on a relative basis where the velocity increases. So that's what streamlines can tell us. So here on the left is an open channel. This you can think of as water flowing down a river or a channel. And so these little dashed lines at the top, that's meant to uh, invoke the idea of like shimmering water that's in contact with the air. Whereas the image on the right is a cross-sectional view of an enclosed pipe. And so the thick black line at the top and the bottom, coupled with the gray shading, is meant to just kind of suggest that it's water that's flowing through a circular pipe. Mm -hmm. Just like the outside of the scope of what we're learning so far, but shouldn't the velocity at the walls in the rightward example be zero? They are, yeah, yeah. But um, the, the streamlines, um, there can be a velocity profile here. So like, here's the pipe. The velocity is slow, it's Getting bigger, bigger, it's okay. more. It's less, it's less, and still the streamlines, the streamlines look like the same. the same. Yeah. But there is a, uh, a no slip condition at the, at the edges. Yep. These are also streamlines. So this is a tank that has an orifice in the side, a hole. The water's flowing out of the side of the hole. So think about just if you cut a hole in a tank, the water would start to gush out. So the water's going down. It's accelerating as it approaches this exit point. And so these streamlines are changing direction. So that's acceleration. Remember, velocity has two components. It's got magnitude and direction. And when either one of those things change, there has to have been an acceleration to cause the change. And so when the direction or magnitude of velocity is changed, that suggests that there's an acceleration. So here, as the streamlines change their direction, and as they're getting close together, there is an acceleration of the fluid. So then the water goes out as a, um, as a jet, a fluid jet. Here's more streamlines. 
uh, flow along a wing can be sometimes uh, interrogated and experimented with using streamlines. And one of these streamlines just stagnates right at the front leading edge of the wing. There's a stagnation point where the velocity of the gas was moving, but then it just it hits the front of that wing and it doesn't go to the top, it doesn't go to the bottom, it's just there's a little bit of air that comes to stop on the leading edge of the wing. And that stagnation point is interesting because there's a slight increase in pressure on the leading edge of the wing because of that fluid stagnating. Here are some other instances, a, a converging pipe section. So this is like a nozzle where you had a large diameter pipe that's contracting downward into a small diameter pipe. And uh, so the fluid is accelerating. Um, it's speeding up from left to right. So the velocity is increasing. And as the streamlines get closer together, remember that's an indication that magnitude of the velocity is getting higher. Here in this rotational flow, the magnitude of the velocity isn't necessarily changing, but the direction is. And so there would be a centripetal acceleration as the fluid goes in circles on this uh, last image on the right. So those are just a couple of instances where we can get some information from streamlines. It can tell us the direction of the flow, changes in velocity, and where pressure might be adjusted because of changes in velocity. There are different flow classifications that we can make. And uniform flow is where there's no change in the magnitude or direction of velocity with respect to position. So uniform flow, velocity is constant in the direction indicated by the streamline. So water's flowing downhill. It's not any faster up here than it is down here. If it was faster, like if it was speeding up, then the depth of the flow would have to change. But we can see the depth is the same and the streamlines are parallel. And so that means that we have a constant velocity. In the direction of flow, the change of velocity is zero. So here this is saying the change in velocity with respect to position is zero. That's uniform flow. Non-uniform flow is where the velocity is changing with respect to position. So if we do have a change, then the streamlines are either not parallel or curved. And so that suggests that there's a change in either the magnitude or the direction of the velocity, or both. You have to remember these definitions. 100% of the time, I'll give you a question on exam two or the final exam where I ask you to classify flow. So I'll, I'll give you a sketch or I'll describe a scenario and I'll ask you to diagnose the flow condition. And so I'll be asking you to tell me, is the flow uniform or non-uniform? Is the flow here steady or unsteady? Is the flow here laminar or turbulent? There's all these different kinds of classifications that you'll need, be, need to be able to make by applying an understanding of these definitions. So non, uniform versus non-uniform is all about as the fluid is moving through space, is the velocity changing or constant with respect to position? So we haven't yet said anything about flow over time. This is just flow with respect to position. So when time isn't a factor, then that means now and an hour from now, the velocities are going to be the same. It's just as the fluid moves through space that the flow is non-uniform. So another type of non-uniform flow is, think about a river. Let's do a top view. So here's a river that's really wide. And then it contracts down into a narrower river. So from the top. It's wide, and then the flow is choking down into a narrower channel. And so that would also be non-uniform, where it doesn't have to do anything about how the flow is changing over time. It's just as the water moves along its path, is the velocity changing in some way? OK, so the first designation was uniform versus non-uniform. Next is steady versus unsteady. 
Steady means that there's no change over time. Unsteady means that the flow is changing over time. So if the streamline patterns aren't changing over time, that just simply means that you can come back an hour from now and it's the same flow rate, the same velocity, things are unchanged. I can't show you pictures at a single instant of steady versus unsteady flow. Um, I can show you a before and after that uh, illustrates unsteady flow or a video and in fact that's what I've got is kind of an interesting video that shows uh, unsteady flow. Let me stop this recording. So uh, he was hiking and uh, it's a dry riverbed. You know obviously water comes through some sometimes otherwise the riverbed wouldn't be there. But over the course of a minute, it goes from dry riverbed to raging river. So it wasn't because someone upstream like broke a dam. It's not that. Any guesses? Geyser? Geyser? Uh, I guess that's a, a fair guess. In this case, it wasn't a geyser. Did it rain? It rained. Yeah, it's just as easy as... Uh, it rained in the watershed upstream and it rained really hard in an area where the soil um, isn't able to absorb much water. There's no vegetation, there's not a lot of uh, plants covering the ground and those sorts of things will slow down a flash flood. Also it's steep and so that contributes to uh, the quick arrival of the peak flow. Just as a side note, next semester I'm going to be teaching a class called Hydrology, uh, CE 433. And uh, the prerequisite for that is this class, uh, Fluid Mechanics. And so if you're interested in things like flash floods and, and movement of water through the environment, that class counts as either a civil engineering elective or a technical elective. It's not a civil engineering design elective, but it is counting as a civil engineering elective or a technical elective. So consider that. Um, but here, that's an illustration of unsteady flow, where flow conditions definitely changed over time. And it was bigger than the last. All right, so we've talked about steady versus unsteady, uniform versus non-uniform. And uh, now let's discuss laminar versus turbulent flow. When flow is moving slowly through a pipe, then, um, and by slowly I mean really slowly, it's pretty an unusual condition to have laminar conditions uh, through a pipe. It's rare that the velocities will be low enough, but when there is a low velocity, what essentially happens is that the fluid slips over uh, other layers of fluid without causing turbulence and without interacting with the edge walls of the pipe in such a way that it causes mixing from one place to the other. So this blue line represents the velocity distribution where at the center of the pipe the water is moving the fastest because that's where it's the furthest away from the friction that's caused by the edge wall of the pipe. Here at the edge wall the velocity is zero because the fluid has the same velocity as the pipe that's in contact with. And there's this kind of gradual transition between zero velocity flow and maximum velocity at the center of the pipe. So you can experience this laminar conditions when the Reynolds number is less than 2,000. And the formula for Reynolds number is here on the screen. It's density of the fluid, the velocity of the fluid, a length parameter, most commonly the diameter of the pipe, and then dividing that by the viscosity of the fluid. And this is the absolute viscosity. There's an alternate way to solve for the Reynolds number, because remember kinematic viscosity is absolute viscosity divided by density. So you can also have Reynolds number as being velocity times diameter divided by kinematic viscosity. And it's this version of the Reynolds number formula that I sometimes just 
use because it only has three terms on the right hand side. It's a little bit uh, quicker to write than this one. But uh, you know, the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, typically. The viscosity of water is 1 times 10 to the minus third Newton seconds per meter squared. The kinematic viscosity of water typically is 1 times 10 to the minus sixth meter squared per second. That's kind of the standard room temperature water kinematic viscosity. So laminar, you can think of it as the water is quiescent. It's not turbulent. The flow conditions are smooth and gradual. But most of the time, when turbulent flow occurs, that's where the Reynolds number is greater than 4,000. And so it's common in fast moving fluids, like uh, water going through a pipe at usual speeds or uh, a ship's wake. And inside of a pipe, rather than having this gradual transition, there's just a lot more chaos where the velocity at any particular point may be high, it may be low, but because the fluid is bouncing off of the side wall and it's interacting, the, the, the particle of any one particular path may be very jagged and uh, irregular. Whereas if you followed a single particle, it would stay in pretty much the same spot as it goes through the pipe when the conditions are laminar. There's no like ricochet of the fluid because the internal resistance of the fluid um, is keeping kind of the particles moving in the same direction. But that internal resistance has been overcome in turbulent flow where there's enough energy in the fluid where random movement is possible. So below 2,000 laminar, above 4,000 turbulent. In between, we think of that as transition. And uh, it depends on whether the flow was previously laminar or previously turbulent. So let's get some practice using this formula for Reynolds number. By the way, it's unitless. The units cancel out. So think about the units of kinematic viscosity, meter squared per second in the denominator. And in the numerator will be meter squared per second. So Reynolds number is a unitless par parameter. So what is the Reynolds number if you have 0.1 meters per second flow of water through a 2.5 meter diameter pipe? OK, so that I'd like you to answer. And then also, what's the maximum flow velocity for this 2.5 meter diameter pipe where the flow will be laminar? Okay, so for part A, we've got D is 2.5 meters, V is 0.1 meters per second, kinematic viscosity is 1 times 10 to the minus 6th. So what we need to do is put that into the formula for the Reynolds number, and we have 250,000. So even at 0.1 meters per second, the flow conditions would be turbulent since that's above 4,000. The criteria is if it's above 4,000, then it'll be in the turbulent zone. Part B suggests that uh, we want to see laminar flow conditions. We want to experience that Reynolds number of 2,000. So what would have to be the flow velocity for a diameter of 2.5 meters? And you can see that the flow velocity would be no more than 0.8 millimeters per second. Um, today we're going to do this in the lab. We're going to actually see laminar and turbulent flow going through a clear translucent plastic pipe. Um, our pipe is much smaller than 2.5 meters. It's just a one centimeter diameter pipe. And so what that means is that the flow doesn't have to go as slow as this for us to still be able to see uh, laminar flow. You know, think about this being the, den the denominator. 2.5 meters means that the velocity would be much slower when you have a large pipe. But if you have a smaller pipe, then you can still get away with a little bit of speed and see the laminar flow. So it'll be interesting, I guess, in the case of this 0.1 
or the, the one centimeter diameter, it seems like when it's moving much more than two or three feet per second, the flow starts to get turbulent. And that's, there's a little bit of an art to it. I mean, it's a subjective thing, the visual indications of whether the flow is laminar and turbulent. So we'll kind of collectively decide between us as we look at this dye being injected into a pipe. We'll be looking at the dye and whether it's squiggling around or whether it's staying together as a distinct stream um, and trying to assess whether the flow conditions are laminar or turbulent are yet. And what we'll actually do is we will use this formula to calculate, like visually, what do we think the break point is. And so we're going to compare it to these commonly accepted break points of 2,000 and 4,000. I mean, this is just a kind of an order of magnitude estimate. Maybe better than that, but I mean, is anything in life really a nice round number like that, 2,000? It's not going to be exactly 2,000 where we begin to see indications that we're out of the laminar zone. So that'll be today's experiment. Any questions about this uh, example? Okay, so we've talked about steady versus unsteady, uniform versus non-uniform, and laminar versus turbulent. Position is how velocity is changing in non-uniform flow. Velocity is changing over time for unsteady flow. Uh, in subsequent lectures, we're going to fill in more things on this slide. This is just so far like a compare and contrast slide that explains how uniform versus non-uniform is different from steady versus unsteady. We actually get equations from looking at how pressure changes due to non-uniform flow. And there's another equation that describes how pressure of a fluid changes when you have unsteady flow. So what we're doing right now is kind of setting the groundwork for equations that we're going to see later where some acceleration is causing a change in pressure of a fluid. We talked about a streamline already. There are a couple of other ways to visualize flow. A path line is a connect the dot where you take a particle and you keep track of where that particle is moving through a flow field and then you connect all of the dots. Like if I went over to the Ohio River and I threw a bottle in the river and I flew my drone above and took a bunch of pictures, I could connect the dots of where the bottle is over time and that would be the path line. It's just where this one particular particle was at different instances. So that's a path line. A streak line is a little bit more tricky to think of. Um, and the way to understand what a streak line is, is it's a continuous injection of some sort of a tracer, like a die. And then where the, uh, the pattern of that die is tells you the history of movement over time. So there's a bridge over the river, not far from where we're sitting right here. And um, think about what would happen if I walked across that bridge and I was pouring paint over the side of the bridge as I did that. So I'm walking across the bridge and I'm pouring paint simultaneously. By the time I got over to Ohio, the paint that I'd poured at the beginning while I was still on the West Virginia side, that would be all the way down the river a ways. But the paint that I was just barely pouring would just be entering the river and it would still be pretty close to where I was pouring it in. So where the, uh, the movement started is at the end of the streak line. That would be the first paint that got poured into the river. So um, let's practice some of the ideas with the following scenario. There's going to be a period in time at which the water is moving to the right. So before some instant in time. In the before period, the water's flowing to the right. And then in the after period, water's moving right and up. So it's at an angle. So there's two different time periods. This is from an image in your book. And I think it's a little bit hard to deconstruct the image unless you think of its two times being simultaneously displayed on the same image. So the before when the fluid was, fluid was going to the right, and then after it was going up 
and to the right. So here's that image. So our streamlines, the before streamlines are going sideways, and then the after streamlines are going up and to the right. So look at the path line. This is just a particle over time as it's traveling through the fluid. It would get pushed to the right during the first period. And then during the second period, it would move up and to the right. So if we connected the dots, then we could draw a path line that just kind of indicates the starting point of the particle and the ending point of a particle and all of the times in between. A streak line, remember, is developed by if you're injecting a tracer into a fixed location and the fluid is moving around, but you're continuing to move the tracer, you're tra continuing, in this case, to inject the tracer into the starting point. So this right here is the very first particle of tracer that was injected because it got pushed to the right as the water was flowing. So when I very first started putting in the tracer, these are those molecules of paint or dye or whatever, and they got pushed to the right, and I'm still pouring in the tracer, and so this horizontal line gets shifted up and to the right. So here at the end is that very first particle of tracer that I injected, and it got shifted up and to the right, and so I'm still continuing to inject the tracer at this fixed location that I was before, but this is the starting point and this is the ending point of the streak line. So this kind of compares and contrasts a path line and a streak line. And in this particular image, and in some scenarios, they'll look like a mirror image of each other, the path line and the streak line, but that's not always the case. It is here, but it isn't always that you could simply deduce the streak line by doing the mirror image of the path line. That's not always the case. All right, so in the handout I'm going to give you, uh, okay, now let's first do this example before I give you the handout. Um, what if water was flowing to the right for nine seconds, down for four seconds, and then to the left for six seconds. The path line of that, uh, that's pretty easy to draw. Let me do it here on the whiteboard, what the path line would look like through these three different time periods. So remember, the path line is, you're just thinking of about a single fluid particle and how it's moving. And so it moves at the same velocity during each of these, like the water is flowing at the same velocity during each of the three increments. And so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine units to the right during the first nine seconds. And then one, two, three, four units down during the third period. And then six units to the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so then the path line is just me connecting the dots, and uh, this is the particle at the end, and this is the particle at the beginning. The streak line is best drawn um, if you move a paper, but you keep your hand constant. And so the way to do that would if I could move this whiteboard, I'd move the whiteboard to the right for nine seconds, then I'd move the whiteboard down, and then I'd move the whiteboard to the left. And so that would look something like if I was moving the whiteboard to the right, then this would be my first, uh, this is where the pen would be at the beginning, and so the whiteboard is moving to the right, the whiteboard is moving down, that would make a vertical line like that. If the whiteboard is moving to the left, it would look like this. And so here is the streak line. And this would be the end. And here's the start. And so this would need to be at the location where I was pouring the paint the whole time. 
So you move the paper or the board in the direction of flow. All right, so I have a handout just for you to get some practice with drawing streak lines, uh, streamlines and uh, half lines. Okay, up on the screen I show the solution of this first one. So the, the fluid moves three units to the right. So the particle that's being tracked goes with the fluid during the first period. And then it's, going, it's getting pushed down two units during the second period. And it's getting pushed to the side during time five through nine and then another two units of rightward movement in the last period. And so this is what the path line would look like. Part, particle is released at A and then ends up here at this location. I guess I could have labeled that as the ending point of the path line. Now in the next part, the reason why I've given you two different windows is for one of them, you can get what the shape of the streak line should look like by putting your pencil in the grid and moving the paper in the direction indicated by the arrows. So if you put your pencil or pen in the grid and you move the paper to the right for three units and then down for two units and to the angle and move the paper to the right, then you can trace out what the shape of the streak line is going to look like and then you can transpose that shape over to the left side of the paper to make sure that it was here at location B that the uh, streak line is ending. So this would be the first particles of fluid that were injected right at the beginning of time zero. And then at location B is kind of like the present moment at the end of time 11. Let me give you a moment just to uh, finalize tracing those shapes and then we'll briefly talk about acceleration before we finish. There's two important types of acceleration that we're going to be looking at in the coming days. One is local acceleration, and that is when fluid is unsteady. And convective acceleration is when fluid is non-uniform. So local acceleration is probably what you learned about in physics, where maybe you were calculating like the forces of an accelerating object. Here's a picture of some local acceleration, not a picture, a video. This is an ejection seat from a, uh, an airplane. They put it on a sled, shoot it forward, and then they eject the ejection seat just to make sure that even at ground level that ejection seat could get the pilot high enough in the air. So that's local acceleration. Was it, it was at rest and then it went to a positive velocity really quickly. Um, centripetal acceleration is where something is being rotated about in a circle. And here they're doing a G test on a pilot. They're 
tracing a circle and uh, because the direction of velocity is constantly changing, that's causing an acceleration and the idea is that the person inside the capsule there is experiencing a force and then they have to practice the, the feelings you know, like how to lock in their stomach and keep from blacking out during a high g-force. And so that centripetal acceleration is, uh, we'll be looking at the changes in pressure that are caused by a rotational movement of a fluid as well. So when we pick up on, uh, on Thursday's class, we're going to look at a nozzle like this. This nozzle is where water enters at a low velocity and exits at a higher velocity. And we want to know how is the pressure changing in a situation like that. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you in Thursday and also for lab this afternoon. Here's the handout for today's lab. Please grab it on the way out just so you can look it over. The handout for today's lab.